That's the idea that the laws of physics, whatever they are, the basic underlying laws of physics, not the laws within a given submarine, but the laws of the whole shebang permit many, many different environments. In this case, a submarine is an environment, permit many, many different uh, possibilities. And that in, for reasons yet to be understood, the universe or the multiverse or whatever we want to call it is sufficiently big to contain just a vast number of those possibilities. That was the idea. Uh, it goes back, I'm not even sure who it goes back to. It certainly wasn't me who first formulated that idea. The idea that, or the, um, the mathematics behind it consists of basically two different things. One of them is the idea of inflation, that the universe expands exponentially. Uh, because it exponentially expands, it became extremely large. And not only it became extremely large, but fluctuations happen. Funny little bumps happen uh, in its expansion, which produce changes in what the, uh, in what the basic, um, in what the, the rules are. They create different environments. Don't think of different laws of nature. Think of different environments. They produce lots of these little bubbles with lots of, and that's a mathematical concept which has taken hold. It is, um, there's mathematics to it, there's equations for it. It's the equations of inflation or what's usually called eternal inflation. Just the universe keeps bubbling and bubbling and bubbling and bubbling up these different environments. That sounds, that sounds sort of what you would call it um, fantasy. But the fact is that the mathematics that we understand the universe by now, inflation, does lead to that picture. Or at least we think it leads to that picture. The other end of it is how many distinct possibilities are there for these bubbles. And that's where string theory comes in. String theory is a, um, it's like the overarching theory in the case of the, uh, of the um, submarines, each individual submarine would have its own laws which would be contingent on what it was made out of and so forth. But there's a broader set of laws, the laws of chemistry, the laws of physics. String theory is more like the broader set of laws which tells you what's possible. Not what is, but what's possible. And the results of the mathematics of string theory, much to the chagrin of the string theorists, just permitted this vast, vast landscape of possibilities. Uh, you twist the space a little bit that way, you twist it that way a little bit, you put this kind of brain in, you put that kind of brain in, and all of a sudden you have a number of possibilities which is astronomical. I use the word astronomical, maybe it's bigger than astronomical. What's the biggest number in astronomy? Uh, I don't know, the biggest number in astronomy is the number of uh, atoms in the universe, 10 to the 80th or something like that. Here we're talking about numbers that could be 10 to the thousand, 10 to the million. What is it that's 10 to the million? The number of possible outcomes of the equations of string theory. How many different environments it permits. So we have those two things together. The notion of eternal inflation, producing this bubbling universe which just keeps producing more and more of these structures and the number of possibilities of the structures being astronomically large. If that's the right theory, and I don't say that it is, nobody knows for sure. Um, it is the only explanation we have for many things. Then it simply will be true that in some f small, tiny fraction of environments will be conducive to life, will be conducive to evolution, will, be, will last long enough, like the submarines don't crash one way or the other, they'll last long enough to, uh, to have us here to ask the questions. That is, in my view right now, the only explanation of some of the fine-tuning questions of physics. 
Let's come back a minute. We have this fine-tuning question of what is the exact density of a submarine. It needs to be fine-tuned to one part. I remember I once calculated it. In the Pacific Ocean, how, how uh, fine-tuned does it have to be that uh, that um, submarine doesn't either crash or rise to the surface in a billion years? I don't remember the number, but it's some extreme value of fine-tuning, 10 to the minus 100 or something like that. The corresponding quantity in cosmology is not the density of the universe. It's not whether it's like water or anything. It's the dark energy, the magnitude of the cosmological constant. <coughs> if the cosmological constant is too big one way or another, one bad thing will happen. If it's too big the other way, another bad thing will happen. One way or another, it has to be within this tiny, tiny 10 to the minus 120 window in order that, number one, that the structures form in our universe, galaxies, stars, and so forth, that permit environments where we can survive, and um, that, the, uh, that the universe can last long enough before it just... Uh, what happens if the cosmological constant is too big, the universe expands too fast. If it expands too fast, it just um, suffers a heat death in a small amount of time. So you have a small, narrow window where the universe can last long enough, be of the type that we're familiar with, which can have chemistry, which can have physics, and which can have galaxies. And um, that at the moment, it's been you know, 20, 25 years, or maybe more, a good, actually much more than that, that these ideas have been out there with no alternative idea that seems to make much sense. The problem is confirming it, either by observation, experiment, or such sophisticated mathematics that's kind of beyond us now that we can almost prove that it happened. That's um, something. So a skeptic would be perfectly in order to say, you can't prove that. And a believer in the idea would say, yes, that's true, I can't prove it but do you have a better idea? And the answer is nobody has put forward a better idea. That's where we are now. That's what the book, The Cosmic Landscape, is about. Mm -hmm.